Hey guys, so I just wanted to do a quick story time that accompanies the latest article on thesoullight.com titled, That Day When I Called the Police on a White Woman. Welcome to the Soul Light. Podcast coming up exclusive. It's the Soul Light Sean. Listener discretion is advised. You're in soul. So yes, you can read it on thesoullight.com. Remember to like, share, and subscribe to this YouTube channel. And so let's kind of get into this story that happened in, I want to say like around 2006. Um, I was living in San Francisco and a group of Asian American guys, friends, uh, decided we decided to take a weekend trip to LA I think it was for some film festival and we were staying near the airport but we were coming back it was about not that late at night uh, in the article I say it's about probably 10 p.m. and we and it was just crowded for some reason in the parking lot and in front of us there was like some elderly couple just slow with parking and so we were just waiting, but I guess it was a little bit out of eyesight if another person came in behind us, which happened. It was this like group of like white girls, like the driver was really aggressive, started honking and uh, saying like profanities, get the fuck out of the way or stuff like that. And so at first we're just like, oh God, this is like whatever, you know, um, and then it kept going, so of course we're gonna turn around and look. And then Albert, the guy who was driving, just kind of popped his head out the window, says like, sorry, there's like somebody up there. We're waiting for them to park so that we can move and then we'll move. She wasn't having none of it. It was like, and the reason why I think I remember it being late at night is that she had the convertible top down. Obviously, she had rented this car, rented a convertible to probably drive around LA with that kind of like fantasy of like Southern California. And the weird thing was, like I said, it was like 2006, but she looked like she was like, you know, brought from a time capsule from 1987. She had like some, you know, overprocessed blonde hair with like dark roots and it was like really curly. Anyhow, so real kind of like when you when I when I say that, I kind of take that as a first warning, a red flag that she might be a little bit entitled and she might use her, you know, whiteness to try to do something. Anyhow, so we parked, we were walking towards the elevator, and then she was still in her car, and she basically, like, uh, accelerated and purposely hit Albert, the guy who was driving our car, and said, fucking chinks, get out of the way, or fucking chink. I just remember it was like, ching, 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 all of that. <sighs> I was like, okay, whatever. I, we went to see if Albert was hurt, and you know, he wasn't, it wasn't like, you know, a huge hit, but that does take some balls, like, to literally say, like, um, I'm gonna go and hit you, you know, no matter how hard it was or not. So we go up back up to the room, we're just, like, kind of, you know, getting ready for bed, and, like, uh, Albert was just, like, sitting on the edge of one of the beds next to the nightstand, just staring into space and so I knew he wasn't like okay and when I see that expression I'm like oh it's like the first time racism has probably hit you so I asked him you know is this the first time you know something like this has happened and he's basically saying yes see we were in our mid-twenties, and by the time you're in your mid-twenties, you do, of course, have racist incidents all throughout your life, but usually up until that first moment where it kind of hits you, you, you kind of let it 
slide off your back, you uh, give them the benefit of the doubt, you think maybe you misunderstood, like you come up with all these reasons and excuses where it's not so bad. But when you finally, like after, like it just, there is no other way to put it, and it makes you feel uh, powerless and literally alone. Um, it's sort of like this feeling of like you can't really breathe and like like for me it kind of like the hearing um, it's like you're in like a, a vacuum and your stomach kind of falls um, like it almost feels like you're free falling and that there's like kind of nobody to help you uh, and then they're literally most of the time literally there isn't like and that's the terror is like it kind of I think brings back a part primordial thing like if you're alone in the jungle there's a predator who has um, an unfair asymm asymmetrical advantage over you and there's nothing you can do about it and so that's essentially what this white supremacy and racism is is that no matter where you go, it doesn't matter, like, what job you have, what degree you have, how much money you have, like, what you're wearing, what car you're driving. At any moment, if they pull out the white card, anybody can abuse the system. And you don't know what the consequences can be, but they're basically just going to be bad. Or you're not going to win. And I think that first moment where you <laughs> realize that that's kind of like the world you're living in, and especially the later you wait until for this to happen, the harder it'll be. It's like the chicken pox. You want to, you know, get it done, like, when you're a kid. But some people, like, I think it happens later in life. Um, yeah, like after college, probably. Um, and I could see that he was kind of like, you know, you couldn't, you can't talk because it's like trauma. And it, it, the thing is, it's different for everybody. That's the thing that um, makes it a little bit like gaslighting is that you don't know when or what degree, you know, a racist incident will have an impact, whether it's going to be one of the things that you kind of like rationalize away or kind of let pass or whether that's the one. So this was a one. So uh, when I was just like, oh, shoot, you know, we're witnessing something here. This is the one. This is when he's basically like, this is his first time. And so I was like, OK, well, you know, do you want to like go report this try to find out where she is at least alert the hotel or do something where you know we can talk to the hotel and see what we can do he didn't know what to do so i was like okay fine i picked up the phone i'll just call from here and called the front desk asked to speak to the manager said that there was a hate crime or a hit and run it's one of the guests hit us on purpose and yelled racial epithets at us and she's in the hotel can you help us find her even in 2006 like hate crime wasn't really a thing because in this era it was like they didn't really know what a hate crime was if hate crime had to have like a swastika or had to have like a kkk hood or had to have murder or something otherwise people don't understand like what a hate crime would be especially if it never happened to you i knew that i wasn't going to get anywhere with the uh hotel so you know hung up the phone and i told albert well there's nothing you know they're gonna do they're not gonna take any responsibility for this um and that's the thing like there's nothing you kind of can do, so that's the problem where you don't feel like there's any kind of way to even or settle the scores, but you do feel like something has been robbed from you and um, 
you don't know exactly how to go about it. So lucky he had me, and I was just all raring to go, like, you know, I was like, this is not my f battle, but it sort of is, because she attacked all of us with her racial epithets. Albert was just the one that got hit, but she attacked all of us. And so I was like, all right, my light went on. And I was like, you know what? I'm gonna call the police. If the hotel can't do anything, I'm gonna call the police. So I called the police and I explained what happened. At first they didn't understand a hate crime either. And so I said it was hit and run. Um, there was somebody who got hit by a car in the hotel on purpose and she's here and the hotel won't help us investigate. So, three cops show up, Latino guy, white guy, and an Asian guy. I don't know, that was so cool. So, you know, at first like, you gotta talk to, you know, white guy and like explain what happened. He went to go talk to the hotel management. I talked to the Latino guy first and just wasn't like getting the whole hate crime thing either. I mean, not all uh, minorities also get hate crime. And then so I decided to change tack and like really try with the Asian guy. Cause you know, like Asian, Asian, even though like here in Korea, like <laughs> if even if you're from a different part of Korea or even like a different part of Seoul, like, you know, people find differences to like fight each other with. But no, in America, we're all brothers. So I was like, hey, bro, bro brother. So. And I was just like, the only way he'd kind of understand is if I can kind of, and I know that there there must be like racism even within the police force where he feels like othered and devalued. So I don't remember what I said, but I knew, I remember my objective was try to metaphor, make metaphors to where he's, he has hurt as well. So I think it worked or something to some extent. So they said that they were going to go find her and they'll give us a call. So, you know, we went back up and then, I don't know, about like an hour later, they, they called us back down and they said that they found her. Um, they talked to her. They shook her up. They scared her a bit. Uh, they said that, you know, we could press charges if we wanted to, but that would involve coming back at a later date to go to some court for some stupid thing with some stupid, stupid person. Um, and she'd have to come back too. So we're like, whatever, okay, um, just let it go. And, you know, I think that's what Albert wanted, but at least we tried, we did the whole thing. Um, and when I went back up, guess who? Like the elevator opened and it was that, it was that hoe. And I was like, I'm not getting into the elevator with her, but, God has given me this opportunity to, you know, say something to her face. And I was just like, you know, 20 something, a little bit immature, I guess. Or I wanted her to feel the pinch of not just insult, but a racial insult to kind of let her know what it feels like. And I was trying to think of like, what is a white racist thing to say, um, or a racist thing to say about white people. And I was just like, well, that's what white supremacy is. There is nothing really that can hurt, like, white people, uh, through language, the way that they have developed a language against minorities. And so the best I could come up with was, I hope you enjoy going back to the trailer park white track. And I think actually that's probably the harshest you can get. And I feel bad about that because that's actually more classist and more economic than um, even racial. And of course, like she got rolled her eyes because <laughs> it meant nothing because it was weak and that and then the doors closed and then, you know, that was the, that was the end of it. But I did feel very proud of myself. And now at that point knew it was possible Yes, you can call the police on white women. And they come. The police come. Yay! And they take care of things. So, Karen's, Becky's, you all better watch out because we can call the cops on you. And so this was back in 2006 and, you know, I was like in the past couple years just like, oh man, all these all these like 
Becky's peppermint patties, or what was it, permit patties, and Karen's been calling the police and weaponizing their victimhood and really threatening the lives of minorities. I was like, how come minorities don't call the police on white women? And then I was like, oh yeah, about like 15 years ago, I called the police and the LAPD, for that matter, on a white woman. So, when you think things are not possible, think again, because they can be possible. Alright guys, we'll see you later. Bye-bye. Tune in next time. Don't forget to subscribe. Find us on YouTube, Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. Love you.